know some people in life that need an introduction. We read introductions before people come out to speak to us. We read introductions before people perform. But we serve a God that needs no introduction today, amen? Yeah, Lord. Thanks. Oh, just like some people say, I remember hearing them growing up. Uh, he's good all by himself. God is good yes. all by himself. And the thing I love about his goodness is it doesn't matter how good I feel like he is in the moment. He's still good. My back can be against the wall. I cannot know which way I'm going, which way to turn, but God is still good. I can run out. I cannot have enough, but the Lord is still good today. Oh, we serve a God that's more than enough, and he's good all by himself this morning. God, we thank you for your goodness. God, we thank you for your mercy. God, we thank you for your amazing grace today, Lord God. Anybody thankful today? Rumors of the sun and man, stories of the Savior, holiness with human hands, treasure for the trader, no ear is heard, no eyes see, Jesus, the image of
we sing this? Yes, you are worthy. Jesus. You are worthy of your name. This morning, you are worthy. You are worthy of your name. Jesus. Community. Well, as you've seen, we've had the stage decorated with the couches and the rug just kind of help us with our relationship series. So I just decided if you guys are going to sit down, I'm going to sit down. That was a bad joke. Anyway, hey, I want to I read some movie quotes to you, and I want to see if you can guess them, all right? Now, we're going to start way back. Uh, this one's from 1946. So if you guess this one, we're going to know you're... Anyway... Maybe you saw it. It's a classic. Remember, George, no man is a failure who has friends. A wonderful life, 1946, all right? Let's step it up to 1959. It's an insane world, but in it there's one sanity, the loyalty of old friends. Judah, we must believe in one another. This is a tough one. Ben Hur. Let's go to 1982. We're going to transport. That was a terrible hint to 1982. You are my superior officer. You are also my friend. I have been and always shall be yours. Star Trek, The Wrath of Khan. Listen, that's the only time, the only movie I've ever cried at in my life. When Spock died, I thought I was done. I almost cried in the new one when Kirk died, but eh, not him. 1986. I never had any friends later on like the ones I had when I was 12. That's the narrator of Stand By Me. Very good. 1994. From that day on, we was always together. Jenny and me like peas and carrots. Forrest Gump. 2001. Wow. Only a true friend would be, or only a, a true friend would be that truly honest. Parents, younger guys, it was a donkey doing the talking. Shrek, 2001. The last one, some of, the, some of those of you that share the same little bit borderline nerdy movie uh, uh, fan base that I do. Who was this Thor in Oakenshield? He was my friend. Who said that? Bilbo Baggins, The Hobbit, The Battle of Five Armies, 2014. You guys are really good. Now what about a couple song lyrics? And there won't be as many of these, okay? So listen. When we were least expecting it, when we're least expecting it, One day in some far off place, I will recognize your face. I won't say goodbye, my friend, for you for you and I will meet again. Anybody? It's the legend Tom Petty just passed away from 1991. You and I will meet again. Can't believe some of you guys didn't get that one. And one more. This is the last one. It's been a long day without you, my friend. And I'll tell you all about it when I see you again. We've come a long way from where we began. I'll tell you all about it when I see you again. Everybody knows that one, right? What, was, what movie? Furious 7. That was written in honor of Paul Walker who died before the release of Furious 7. So what are all of these movies, titles, and songs lyrics have in common and and by the way I, I could go on for days but I'll leave it right there they all have themes and stories and lyrics about friendships have you ever had a friend or have you ever cared about somebody so much that you would do anything for them anything a spouse a child What about a friend? 
What a stretch it is to find a friend that we would absolutely do anything for. This month we're in a series at Knollwood called Real Relationships. And we thank you for being here with us today. Today's our big invite. Some of you have been invited by a friend or a family member and we just honor you and thank you for being here. The basis for this series all month is that this is what you and I really want. It's what we really need. It's what we de- we're designed for and that's real relationships. And they're, more, they're so important that they're more important than stuff. That's one of the things that's flipped in our culture is we think we want more stuff. What we really want is more real friendships, the true relationships that meet the need in our life. And to go a little deeper than, than songs and movies, I, I want to tell you today that there's a reason why you and I want these relationships from the day we're born. Some of us don't even realize it, but it's what we crave from our childhood. Deep, lasting relationships. And the reason is because as part of the fallen human race, we're born into a spiritual vacuum. And we have the nature of Adam and we grow as a sinner. And once we reach that age of accountability and we stand before God, we have this void in our heart, in our soul. And this void is a loss of true relationships. It's a spiritual vacuum that draws and pulls us towards something that unless we are taught, we don't even really understand what it is. John Wesley, one of the great fathers of uh, the holiness movement, is famous for taking the idea of the fall to a new level. Okay, He differed with Calvin on some areas in original sin. They they shared the core uh, of that doctrine together. But it was Wesley who said that the fall and sin was not the worst part of what happened to Adam and Eve in the garden. That the fall and the sin wasn't the worst part. The worst part is that the result of their fall was their separation from God. So instead of total depravity, he focused on total depravity, the breaking of that relationship between Adam and Eve and God. It's what they were called to be. It's who they were designed to be. And therefore, if their relationship with God was broken, the supreme relationship for which they were designed, every other relationship that they would ever have would be distorted as well because the foundation of their relationship with the Lord had been compromised in the fall. And see, that's the problem. That's why we're born with this spiritual void in our life that we can't get to God, that deep uh, void in our soul can't be repaired. And even though we have good relationships, I love, you know, I loved my family before I got saved. I had some friends uh, in low places. I just had to throw that out there. I'm sorry. That was terrible. Some of you will get it later. Um, They were good relationships, but they weren't all that they were supposed to be. There was always that nagging. Man, we try everything, don't we? Sometimes we try drugs. Sometimes we try, you know, illicit relationships. Sometimes we try materialism. We, we fight for ways to fill that void many times without even knowing what it is. And this is why it's that spiritual vacuum. Guys, that's why the story of Jesus is the greatest story ever told. We existed apart from God and could not get back to Him on our own. And that's why Jesus, who loved all of humanity so much, from Adam to Eve to the first generation and the second, and all the way to all of those that would be born in the history of time, Jesus loved us so much that He chose willingly to be born of a virgin and live a sinless life and die a humiliating death of rejection A brutal death, if you will, and rise from the dead. He did that for us. Now in John 15, verses 13, 14 and 15, he's teaching and he says to you and I as disciples, to you and I, greater love hath no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if I command you, if you do what I command you. He said, no longer do I call you servants. Jesus repaired our ability to have a relationship with God. He said, for you are my friends. The servant doesn't know what his master's doing, but I've called you friends. 
I want to share with you a couple of things to consider about what Jesus has done for us to repair our relationship with God and then our relationships with others. The first one is, and I'm going to be brief, somewhat brief today, the first one is, is that He loved us first. You know, when Chloe was born, she was a, 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 when she was small, a song come out. And you know, men aren't emotional until they have a daughter. And then it freaks you out, right? You think about, what am I going to do when I have to scare some, you know, scrawny boy at my house that was like I was, and I'm going to threaten him with dismemberment and all that kind of stuff. There was a song that came out, uh, and I don't, I don't really remember the title, but it was called, uh, it was about he lo- I loved her first. You hear it at a lot of weddings. And I remember reading that song and thinking, I am not looking forward to that day, although I do want it to come. You know what the crazy thing about the love of God is? He loved you and me when we didn't even know He existed. He loved you and me before we ever repented and gave our life to Him. He loved you and me when we were sinners, when we were steeped in our rebellion and our rejection of Him, and when we had no desire for Him at all, He loved us first. He made a decision in eternity before time that one day He was going to hang on a cross after being brutally whipped at Pilate's whipping post with a shredded body, and He was going to die for you and I when we didn't give a rip about Him or know He was even in existence. It's, there's just something powerful about the love of God that loved us first. You see, 1 John 4 and 10 says, In this is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Just the propitiation means He paid for it. He was in the middle. He bridged the gap. He covered us. And He did that when we were pretty unlovable. Now, some of you only know me as the pastor, and I'm, uh, and I'm kind of glad of that because I don't want to revert to my old life. But you lose something sometimes when you move into a city where people don't know what kind of transformation you've had in your life. I was not a good, a good kid or a, a good person. I'm not proud of that, but I'm telling you, God did a transforming work in me that radically changed my life. And I look back on that, And I realized that He loved me when I didn't even know He existed. He loved me when I was doing everything contrary to His plan and His word. He loved me when I was saying horrible things about Him. He loved me when I used His name the wrong way. He loved me when as a child growing up, I heard the the vulgar uh, 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 use of God's name in vain every day. He loved me when all around me was sin after sin after sin in a culture and a climate of sin I had no idea who he was he loved me then he loved me when I was rebellious enough to sin on my own Romans 5 and 8 says but God shows his love for us while we were yet sinners Christ died for us it's incredible to think of the love of God loving us first and not only that he loved us regardless of whether we love him It's amazing. Because see, sometimes you meet somebody and you work out a deal and you build a friendship. And from the day we're born, most of our relationships are mutual based. We tend to view the whole world of relationships based on a win-win. I'll scratch your back if you scratch mine. You know, I'll love you if you love me. I'll do for you if you reward me. And if you don't do right for me, then I've got the right to do wrong back. We we build our culture of relationships on a mutual understanding of agreement. But real love loves someone whether or not they ever love us back. What What a beautiful thing to think that God loves those who this morning, today, are stepping through the gates into an eternity of hell. He loves them all the way, whether they love Him or not. So number two is not only did He love us first, but He gave His life for us. He said in the text that there's no greater love than a man would lay down his life for his friends. One of the most important things you will ever learn about theology is that Jesus chose to die on the cross for you and I. 
He was not twisted by God the Father. His arm was not twisted. He was not manipulated into a destiny that existed before Him. He has always existed as one with the Father and the Holy Spirit in the Trinity of God. He's not a created being. There was never a time that anything happened that put a plan in motion that made Him hang on a cross for us. But there was a point in the timeless past where He understood the will of God and the plight of humanity before we were ever created. He knew that we would sin and that we would spend eternity without God. And in that point that we can't recollect somewhere, Jesus made a conscious choice to leave all the splendor of heaven and do what He did because He did not want us to spend eternity without God. It's just a conscious choice He made. He did it willingly, and He paid for my sin. say, Pastor, didn't He pay for the sin of the whole world? Yes, but the sin of the whole world don't help me. He paid for mine. Okay, mine. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I really hate vehicle payments. Um, I despise them. I don't mind spending everything I own on a boat, but I cannot stand... That's a little bit of a stretch, almost. I can't stand paying for cars. Cars and clothes. Man, I hate paying for clothes. I don't mind when I used to fish offshore, we'd spend three or four hundred dollars on gas, and that did, I didn't bat an eye, but man, 65 bucks for a shirt just freaks me out. I can't hardly do it. So I stay at Ross and Marshall's and places like that. You know, I got a truck payment, okay? Went for years of my life, I didn't have one. I feel pretty stupid now. I do have one. And every month when it's time, money's drafted out of my account to cover that truck payment. Money is not drafted out of any of your accounts to pay my truck payment because it's my debt. Now, if you want to pay it, see me after service. I'll hook you up. But it's my debt. Jesus died for the whole world, but that doesn't help me. What helps me is that the sin debt that had my name on it, the signature of my DNA, the fiber of who I am, the fabric of my soul, Jesus paid for mine. And I got to go free because he gave his life for me. So my account has paid in full by the blood of Jesus. Listen, and you know, he never even asked me did I want him to pay for mine? That's love. He never even said, I'll make a deal with you. I'll pay for yours, but one day you've got to agree to serve me and be my son. He didn't ask any questions. He said, real love pays your debt regardless if you want me to or not. Not only did he give his life for us, but he also promised. He promised that he would... Uh, never leave us. Hebrews 13 and 5 says, Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have because I'll never leave you nor forsake you. He promised to always be with us. Matthew 28 and 20. He said, And behold, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. And then finally, he also promised that this life's not all that there is. Now guys, I know that in the modern church, we hear so much about living this life for Jesus, And I believe that because I believe that we need to preach the most about the battles we fight the most. And that's now. But somewhere in our tradition we've lost the, the beauty and the splendor of teaching people that there is something beyond this world and this life. And that is a place called heaven. It's an eternity with God that is worth any price it takes us to get there. It's worth all of our toil and our labor. It's worth all that it requires of us. And Jesus said, I'm going to go build that place for you so that where I am, you may be also, John 14, 1 and 3. He's going to set us up and bring us and come and get us. Why would he do all of this? Because he said, greater love hath no man than this that he laid down his life for his friends. I've had some really incredible friends in my life. If you're here next Sunday, I'm going to tell you the story about the greatest friend I've ever had apart from Jesus. Man that impacted my life in a way that I didn't see it coming, didn't ask for it, had no idea it was going to become a relationship that would fundamentally change who I was as a person and as a pastor. And he was one of the most, uh, I, I would have never guessed, I would have never said, show me a lineup, that's the guy that's going to do it. But God ordained it. I've had some great friends in my life. My wife, 
is my greatest friend on earth. Angela is in uh, Knowwood Kids today, and uh, she wore the Wonder Woman outfit last week. But I'm going to tell you, she really is Wonder Woman. And I'm Batman. No, I'm just kidding. So. <clears throat> she really is Wonder Woman. She's the greatest friend I've ever had. After what's here in Kramer say that, I've always wanted to say that publicly. You guys didn't watch Seinfeld? All right. Come on, work with me. If it helps when we're on this train together, right? She's the greatest friend I've ever had next to Jesus. I've had some great friends in my life, but I've never had a friend that loved me like he loves me. You've never had a friend that loves you like he loves you. And I'm so thankful that God the Father created us knowing we were going to sin. Do you know what kind of love that is? He created us knowing that we were going to have imperfections. You know, technology as it exists today, one of the great moral battles of our future is going to be the, the idea of genetic altering for unborn children. The technology is close to be able to take out their imperfections and design them the way we want them designed. An athlete, an artist, you know, all these kinds of things. And it's scary. It's scary. Scary because every parent I know wants their kid to be the best they can be. Every one of us do. But sometimes it's loving them in spite of their imperfections that reveals the heart of God more than their perfection. Jesus could have made us like the angels. He could have made us like the robots without a will to choose. But he loved us so much that before we were ever created, he had full knowledge that we would sin and rebel against him. And the love of God drove the hand of God, the master craftsman, to fashion us anyway. And I can almost imagine as he looked at Adam standing there in perfect form, you know, 18-inch biceps, six foot two, anyway, just perfect Adam, Standing there, he got ready to breathe the breath of life into this lump of clay. And you just wonder, did the thought cross his perfect mind that once he breathed into him, he would set forth in motion a human race that not many years later would openly rebel him and sling humanity into a downward spiral for tens of thousands of years. That would cost himself and the person of Jesus his own earthly life to redeem us back. And yet he still breathed life into Adam. It's love. That is a perfect love for an unimperfect people. In 1987, and I'm going to close this out. In 1987, a story was released of a missionary in a Vietnamese area... And um, they came upon an orphanage that had been bombed. And the missionary group found some of the children were already dead. Some of them were still alive. And they found this one little girl. She was bleeding out. You can look this up online. It's printed in a publication. It's a real story. She was bleeding out. And they knew that they had enough medical training. They knew that if they did not get her some blood, stop her bleeding and get her some blood, she was going to die. The problem was they didn't speak the native language, the same language as the children and the people there. And so they finally quickly found out that the only compatible blood type was some of the children that were living. And so they found this one little boy. And they were trying to communicate to him that they needed to do a blood transfusion so that some of his blood could help save this little girl. But their language was broken, their, their imagery was off, and they did their best until finally, finally the little boy, his name was Hung, H-U-N-G, he, he agreed that he would do it, okay? So Hung said he would. So they laid him down, and they connected the IVs, and it wasn't long into the process that he began to weep Tears flowed from his face and they, they immediately thought something must be wrong with the IV. And so they tried to adjust the IV and he would just shake his head and collect himself. And a few minutes later the tears would burst forth and he would weep again. And they would adjust the IV. They were so confused. They had no idea what was wrong. He couldn't tell them why it hurt. And finally, 
some local people from a local village showed up. A nurse who was also a translator. And she spoke enough of both languages to bridge the gap. And they said to her, we don't know why he's crying. Something's wrong with his IV. We don't know where the pain's coming from. It shouldn't be hurting him. And she communicated to him in his language. And they watched as his countenance changed. And a smile came across his face. And this war-hardened translator nurse began to weep. Probably hadn't shed tears in years. And they said to her, what is wrong? Would you please tell us why you're crying, why he's crying? And she explained to them that through their broken communication, he thought they were asking him for all of his blood to save the little girl. He understood them to say, would you give your blood to save hers? And it would take all of it. Astonished, the missionaries asked the translator to ask the little boy, if you understood that it was going to cost you all of your blood, why did you do it? His answer was, because she's my friend. Because she's my friend. That's a true story. Jesus loves every one of you so much that he just wanted friendship. That he died and gave all of his blood so that you can be his friend. Know the joy of serving Him now. And spend eternity together. Would you bow your heads with me? If you're in here this room today, and you're not, you're not where you need to be with Christ Jesus. You're not in a relationship with Him. You've never came to faith, been born again, got converted, saved, whatever term you want to call it. If you're not walking with the Lord today, I want to lead you in a short prayer. The words I say won't do it, but the cry of your heart will. All you've got to do is mean it from your heart. You don't have to say a perfect prayer or even use my words. You just have to mean it. And the same Jesus that gave all His blood, He's listening and ready right now. As a matter of fact, that, that butterfly in your stomach, that tug in your heart, that movement in your spirit, that's Him right now calling on you. The Holy Spirit through provenient grace is knocking on your heart's door. Saying, just open to us. And we'll bring an eternal friendship. We'll save you from your sins. If you're in here today and you're not where you need to be with Jesus, would you slip your hand up and hold it up so I can pray for you? I don't want to miss you. Thank you for that hand. Is there, thank you for those two hands. Is there anybody else today? Thank you for that fourth hand. Is there anybody else? Thank you for that fifth hand. I understand that some of you have walked with the Lord in the past, but life's got in the way and, you know, you're not where you need to be, even though you know. I'm not here to debate with you about multiple conversions or salvations or security. I just want to know if you're here and you're not where you need to be with God. One last time, would you slip your hand up? Pastor, life got in the way. Thank you for those hands. And I want to reconnect with the Lord. Thank you, young man. Two of you saw that. Guys, there's eight folks today ready to pray. Last call, anybody else? Let's all pray this together because we're the family of God. Dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. And my sin separated me from you. I believe you're the Son of God. And that you died to restore me to you. Forgive me of my sins. Help me to live for you as you give me the grace and show me how. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we give the Lord a huge hand clap of praise today?